Well, good morning, church. Good morning, New Heights. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, any first-time guests out there, first-time viewers, thank you for joining us as well. Um, I'm Pastor Patrick, and today we are celebrating the last Sunday of Advent. So Merry Christmas. Um, hope everyone had a great holiday, a great Christmas. Hope everyone stayed safe and stayed well um, through these uncertain times that we are in. Um, but thank you for taking the time this morning to join us and in worshiping um, our King. As we go into this last Sunday of the Advent, we're celebrating joy. And as we go through this text today, Ruth 4, one of the things we're going to see is that joy is brought on and brought through redemption. It's a joy that we can see through Christ as our Redeemer, that he bought and paid for our sin. He paid um, for us to be free, and he redeemed us. And that is a joy that we can only have through him. So those are some things we're going to kind of talk about as we go through the sermon text today. We're going to go through the entire book. So we may not read the entirety of all of the verses because it is a pretty lengthy chapter. So we're going to go through a couple and then we may paraphrase a little bit this morning um, and just kind of talk about what that means. But the series is under Bethlehem Stars and you see this beautiful um, as Will calls it, uh, a hallmark story. Um, you see Ruth, a big city girl, being led back to a small town, which is Bethlehem. Um, she goes out into the field. She finds Boaz. And last week, we, we left her on the threshing floor. She was uh, at the feet of Boaz through the entire night. And then that's kind of where we left off. You kind of have Naomi trying to set up what looks like this midnight wedding type deal. Um, so it's kind of just a little recap of where we were from last week. But one thing that I do want to talk about about the book of Ruth is it's not just a women's ministry book. <clears throat> Women don't have to go only to Ruth, and they don't only have to go to Esther for insight. But man, this is also a book for us as well, because when we look at every book of the Bible, every book is about Jesus. So there's not one book that doesn't just talk about him or that he doesn't jump off at the page um, as we read it. So it is not just a book for women, and it's not a book that men should kind of stay away from either. So if you have your Bible, you can turn it to Ruth right now. And the three points that we're going to talk about this morning are going to be a redemptive law, redemptive love, and then a redemptive family. So as we read through this, those are going to kind of be the three th themes of redemption that we see throughout this book. We'll start with verse 1, and then we're just going to jump into it. It says, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. He goes to the gate because this is where he would have to find all the men. This is where kind of the meeting place of the town um, is. This is where everyone goes for the meetings. This is where all the judicial uh, magistrates um, <clears throat> hold their courts. This is where everything kind of takes place. So Boaz goes here because he knows that he has to have witnesses for what is about to happen. He knows that... Um, <clears throat> For him to be able to go through with this process, for him to try to redeem Ruth, that he has to follow what is known as this redemptive law. It's that law of redemption. So he goes here. He knows that it's going to take at least 10 men to become a quorum. So we pick up right here from that very dramatic scene that we ended with last week. So Ruth and Boaz want to get married, but what kind of happens here? Naomi was kind of deceitful in the way that she kind of set it up. And this is what leads Boaz to doing what he does here. So like I already said, Naomi was trying to set up one of these midnight wedding type ordeals. But Boaz is a man of God and he's a man of integrity and he's a man of honor. So in being so, Boaz goes to Ruth's nearest kinsman. So this would mean that, that the law said that he had to go to the nearest kin to be able to redeem her and buy the land that, that she had from her husband being, um, being deceased. And the honor had to be up to him in order to be able to buy that from them. And Boaz knew this, so this is why he went there. But this is important because there is someone who could lay hold to that claim as well. Um, and, and this is the way that it had to be fixed. 
Kaboa has, has found an easier way to keep this closer kinsman from redeeming Ruth? Probably not, because the law just wasn't there for it, and he knew that. And then as we go into verse 3 and 4, it says, Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who was or who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I may come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So when he said, I will redeem it, this is, this is that um, kinsman redeemer. This is this goal. So he, there is no name for him in all of the Bible. There is no name in history. So he has been long forgotten because of what is about to transpire. Um, he was the person that was closest to hold these rights, and the Redeemer had to be a kin, and they were always going to be the one that was given this first right, basically of refusal, to be able to buy this. Um, so, you know, in, in business, if you were presented a deal or if I am selling something, um, so in my case, in, in what I do, um, when... When the company I work for, when they sell to an owner operator or they sell to somebody, they always build into a contract the first right of refusal, meaning that if the operator is going to sell a building or sell the company that they have, then the main company is going to have that first right of refusal. They are always going to get the option to be able to be the first person to lay claim to that. And that's what was happening here. Um, and the culture at the time showed that the kinsmen would have to redeem um, the prosperity, the posterity, and also the person themselves. So what I mean by the posterity is the economic well-being of Ruth so, and Naomi. So he was not just redeeming her as a person to ensure that she was safe, but he had to ensure that the economic well-being of Naomi was going to be in place as well. And then the posterity factor of it plays in. The future generations of all people would be taken care of through this one specific um, redemption process. So that's something that I think lay, lays hold to us, and it's very important for us to remember, because we see these three duties in this one person. And, and, and to me, we, we see this representation of God in this, that God, that three in one, the Holy Trinity, he, he's one person with three functions. And, and, it, it, compare, and it com, is in comparison to this Redeemer as well. Um, Boaz presented the situation in a somewhat interesting fashion as well. He brings out the proposition to redeem Ruth in a land transaction. So we know that he, what the ultimate goal that he had, but the way that he presented it kind of, kind of seems a little bit deceitful, right? But we know that it's not. We know that Boaz is a man of honor. He's a man of integrity. But just think of it when you're going to uh, buy those cell phones, right? What happens? We, we sign those contracts, it's presented to us, and then when we get the bill, it's always a little different than what we originally agreed to, right? So you get those extra taxes, you get those hidden fees. So it's, it, it, they just left it out. It's not that he was, he, he was lying about it or he was trying to be deceitful. It was he presented it in a way that the Redeemer was going to want it because he knew that as a man and as a depraved sinner, the first thing that this person would think of was the inheritance that he would be able to have through this. He, he would be able to build his wealth and he would be able to have more um, under him when he has all of this land. So what happens? The Redeemer says, I'm going to redeem it. And I want to think that Ruth and Naomi are within earshot of all of this conversation since Naomi kind of um, put all of this together and um, all of this was transpiring because of her. So I think if they heard him say, we'll redeem it, the breath kind of leaves them for a minute because they're like, oh no, I'm going to have to have to be with this person. Um, it's not who I want to be. I'm not going to be able to be with Boaz, who, who Christ is leading them to. Their hope had been that Boaz would be the one that was ultimately able to purchase the land. And then as we go into verses 5 and 6, we see this. We see, then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself. Lest I impair my own inheritance, take my right of redemption in yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So I think one thing that's important that we, we can look at is that Boaz reiterated two very important things in these verses. One, he 
talked about his desire to redeem Ruth for the family name. He wanted to perpetuate it so that the name would live on. To keep the land in the family of Elimelech. Because the land was rightfully going to go to Chilion and Malon. But Boaz's desires, what I want us to understand, Boaz's desires were not redemption due to selfish reasons. So I don't want us to think that at all. Boaz's desire was to keep that prosperity, that prosperity and that person intact. They were in contrast to that of the kinsman, right? We see that the kinsman says as soon as he hears about that extra baggage, as soon as he hears about those hidden fees, what's he say? He says, I cannot redeem it for myself. Take it for you. This was in complete contrast to what Boaz has been, been wanting this entire time. As soon as he finds out that something more comes with the baggage than more, what he actually wanted, he steps away from the transaction. And a couple reasons for this is the fact that, one, Ruth was of childbearing age. So if she was of childbearing age, he would have had to have married her, brought her home, and he would have had to bear children with her. And if he had more land, he would have had to split all of that land up between the future children that he has and the children that he's already been raising. So selfishly, he didn't want to do that. But two, I think if he was married already and he did have those children, it's going to be a little awkward to bring home a new wife, right? Hey, I purchased land and, and here's a woman that comes along with it and we have to have children. I think that would be a little awkward situation for most of us if, if we had a transaction like that and we had to, and, uh, we had to bring them home. But for, for us, this is uncommon. As depraved sinners, we are prone to want to gain glory. We are prone to want to gain all of the riches that we can. We are not people that turn things away. We are not people that turn things away that grow our bank account. We are not people that turn things away that make people want to draw closer to us and think of us in a way that, that is higher than we actually are. The son named Kinsman Redeemer knew the Levitical law, though. And he used this law for his own gain. And he decided not to pursue with any of this transaction, pursue with the land or pursue with Ruth. And in Leviticus 25, 13 through 17, we see this law come into play. This law that kind of establishes where he gets first rights and what would happen with it. In verse 13, it says, In this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his property. And if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. You shall pay your neighbor according to the number of the years after the Jubilee, and he shall sell to you according to the number of years for crops. If the years are many, you shall increase the price, and if the years are few, you shall reduce the price, for it is the number of crops that he is selling to you. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. So this was one of those laws that, we were, that was established in, in, in Leviticus. And what we see is this beautiful representation of everything that is the Lord's being returned back to the Lord. Everything that God has given us is ultimately going to go back to God. And we see this coming to transpire in Ruth 4. God set up laws to protect and to ensure his people had what they needed and to ensure that they were protected in ways that they would have sufficient means for everything that they acquired and everything they needed in their life. So the land would eventually go back to the owner after 50 years unless a redeemer could redeem it from the person who the land had been sold to. So in this case, when Ruth became a widow, the land ultimately had to be offered back to the Redeemer to have that first right of refusal. And knowing this, the kinsman selfishly chose himself, chose his gain, chose his reward over his redemption. And we prioritize wealth over godliness. And this is exactly what is happening right here. The kinsman chose to not want to spread out the inheritance over new children. He chose to not want to take that on himself. And that's what we do in our lives, church. That, that, that is what we have to step away from. We have to prioritize things in a way that is good for the people of God, for the family of God, for the good of the family of God. We should prioritize godliness over everything else in our lives. We choose what is best for us, not what is best for those around us. We can all take a chunk out of this playbook from Boaz. 
We could all look at his integrity. We could all look at his honor in the way that he listened to the law, in the way that he presented this, in the way that he is handling this. Because in the end, we see that we need a redeemer. This is why we need a redeemer. Our redeemer did not count those costs. Our redeemer instead redeemed us through a death upon a cross that he didn't have to have. He prioritized us over himself. We should consider ourselves to be lucky to have a redeemer who even on the cross wasn't thinking of what he was losing, church, but what he was gaining. Our redeemer with his death on the cross took back what was rightfully his. And in verses 7 through 12, what happens is we see that there's this, this redemption and we see this exchanging of, of sandals to confirm transactions. So in verse 7, it says, Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it yourself, he drew off his sandal. In church, this was one of the reasons why Boaz wanted to be at the gate. He wanted the witnesses there. He wanted those 10 men in this quorum because when this happened under redemptive law, he had to have witnesses see this. But to us, this is kind of crazy. You know, to confirm a transaction, one has to draw off his sandal. So I want you to think for a second. When was the last time you bought a house? When was the last time you bought a car? When was the last time you made a, a large transaction that you had to sign a contract with? Just think what would happen if you took your sandal off or your shoe off and you handed it to that salesman to close out the transaction. It's going to look a little crazy, right? But to them, this was, was not odd at all. This was the law. And what we see is that he forfeited his right, he being that, that unnamed kinsman. He forfeited his right to the land in front of witnesses, which is the law in Deuteronomy 5. You know, in Deuteronomy 5, it says, If a brother died, it was the other brother's duty to redeem the wife of his dead brother and to take care of her. If he did not, she could spit in his face, remove his sandal to publicly shame him and his family's name. Now, this wasn't the reason he was doing it here. Naomi, I'm sure she heard all of this, wanted to run out, wanted to grab the sandal, spit in his face for shaming her in this way. But the way that he handled it was a manner of respectfulness. He took his sandal off and said, it's yours. What we see is that Boaz is exhibiting a love for Ruth. It is a love that is going to redeem her, that is going to take her from that emptiness that she had at one point to the fullness that she has now. So it was a love that would save her, which would kind of go against what we see Boaz learning as he's growing up. And what I mean by that is that Boaz's mother was a prostitute. So Boaz, even in this moment, in the way that he grew up, in the way that he could have viewed women, he chose to love Ruth in a way that was biblical, in a way that God led him to love, and in a way that we see a love lead to a redemptive story in the life of Ruth. We see that Boaz was her redeemer through both marriage and through the saving of her land and family name, we see all three persons at work right here. Boaz became one person with three duties. And it's a good thing to realize that God was using Boaz to see Ruth's needs, to see that she needed him, and to see that she needed a redeemer. She needed to be led somewhere else, and she needed to be redeemed from the situation that she was in. God was working through Boaz in this moment, church. And in his sovereignty, God was using Boaz, and he was using Ruth's obedience to the law. And he was shaping it into a beautiful, redemptive story. And through Boaz's obedience to God, God is using him to bring the bloodline that our Redeemer would come from.
I want you to think about that for just a second. Through Boaz's obedience in loving Ruth for following the law, for redeeming Ruth in the way that God saw fit, God is using him to bring the bloodline that our Redeemer comes from. Through his obedience to the law and through his willingness to not focus on the things of the world, to not focus on fleshly desires and those worldly desires, Boaz's name will be remembered for eternity. Unlike that of the kinsman who only cared about his own selfish desires. And church, as we read this, we too can fall into this pit we become prone to falling into the things of the world and taking ourselves away, away from God and not walking towards the things that are holy, but walking towards the things that are worldly. We are, we are led in this world to want to do things our own way and we are led to love in a way that we want to love and not in a way that we see as a biblical love. But as we read through this story, church, we are reminded that this is Jesus. We are reminded that this entire story is about Christ. In 2 Corinthians 8 to 9, it says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that our love is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. We are reminded, church, in this story that Christ wanted nothing. We are reminded that he didn't need anything. But yet, he gave it all up and he willingly died for our redemption. So that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Church, through this redemption, we have become heirs to the family of God and we have become the bride of Christ. It takes us to redemptive love, which is the second point. Verses 13 to 17. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Bless be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has been given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And then the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. So after Boaz follows this redemptive law and follows in the way that God led him to, we see that he takes Ruth as his wife. God played the perfect matchmaker because nowhere in the text does it say that Ruth was beautiful. Nowhere in it does it say there was any type of courtship. Nowhere in it does he say that he sought after her. But he trusted in God that God placed Ruth into the situation that she was in for a reason. Because Boaz didn't need her. Boaz had everything that he needed. He did not need Ruth. But God needed him to have Ruth. God chose him for his specific plan. For his specific plan of this redemptive love. And he led them to each other and allowed Boaz to see her virtue over her looks. And church, if we can take anything away, we need to look at how Boaz looked at Ruth. While we don't know if she's beautiful or if, if she was attractive, those are things we look at in the world. Those are things that we think we have to, to look at when we are chasing somebody, right? But Boaz sought her out for her virtue, her character, for the things that she did, for how she treated people. Looks are not everything, but he was drawn to the actions of, of Ruth. She cared for Naomi. We see that she's already said, where you will go, I will go. What he saw was Ruth's selflessness to give everything up to care for her mother-in-law. This is what led him to love Ruth. 
His love was rooted in a desire for holiness, church. It was, desi- it was rooted for him to do what was right in the eyes of God, not simply for his selfish desires. And how many of us can say that, church? How many of us can say that we look for the good in people and not just what they look like? How many of us can say that we look at what somebody does, we look at what they do, and we look past their beauty, and we look past the way that they look? How often can we say that we look at the godliness of someone instead of their worldly qualities, instead of how everyone else feels about them, Our love, church, has to be rooted in the foundation of Christ. We have to love in a way that Christ loved us. And we see that as we see Boaz exhibiting this with Ruth. Ephesians 3.17 tells us that we should be grounded and we should be rooted in the love of Christ in all of our actions, in all of our words, in the way that we carry ourselves. And what we see once again is is this obedience. And because of this obedience to God, God has allowed them to love in a way that most of us will never know. This love led them to having a son due to God blessing their marriage. This baby ultimately becomes a grandson of Naomi and she becomes his nurse and she's going to end up taking care of him for the rest of his life. And we see that Naomi could have easily said no. And I think this is one of the most important parts of this passage, church is this redemptive love. How we see Naomi's life being transformed because of the love of Boaz and Ruth. It would have been extremely easy for her to say, no, I don't want it. She could have easily said that God left her and deserted her because that's how she felt. We see the transition from chapter one all the way to chapter four. It is easy to become bitter and have pain when we think we have been wronged. It's easy for Naomi to slip into that pit of despair and think that God has left her. Because remember, at one point, Naomi wanted to be called Mara because there was nothing happy about her life. Remember in Ruth 1.20, she said, but she replied to them, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because the sovereign one has treated me very harshly. She thought God had left her and he had left her in a place to where she would never know happiness again, church. To where he treated her in a way that she had been completely forgotten about. She had no love. She had no one in her life. She wanted to be left alone. But instead, we see that God is blessing her and he is restoring her family line. And in the depths of her loneliness and in the depths of her depression, when she felt she had nothing, when she felt there was no worth in her life or had any hope, Church, God's plan was shining through. What we see is that God restored her hope and he renewed her with this baby, with Obed. And the baby's name means worshiper. I think that's a pretty strong statement as we read this. That her grandson, his name meant worshiper that she was restoring a line that eventually Christ would come from, and he had him named name the mint worshiper. God's love for Naomi was a redemptive love, church. This is in comparison to our lives. When something bad happens to us, we are so quick to lay blame on someone else. We are so quick to judge others for something that has happened. We would never want to look at ourselves Or we're quick to ask God why he's allowing the things to happen in our lives. Why he's allowing them to happen. We find that as depraved sinners, we fall into this pit like Naomi did. We find ourselves angry. We find ourselves bitter. We find ourselves in pain. We find ourselves in a situation that we think God has placed us in because he wants us to be in that situation, to be uncomfortable or to be depressed or feel that pain. But church, let me tell you right now, God places us into situations that we are uncomfortable in so that we can see his love through the blessings we have in him. So that we are faced with our need for him instead of a need for ourselves. David Platt says it this way, God actually delights in our inability. He intentionally puts people into situations where they come face to face with their need for him. 
Church, what we are seeing is a perfect representation of God's redemptive love in the story of Ruth. Naomi sees this love through the redemptive process that she is going through. We too see God's love through Christ's redemption in our own lives. For us, it is the source of all blessings in our life. And I think we all too often forget that. And we need to redirect our focus towards those blessings, towards our need for God. When we have the love of God, we have no need to be worried. We have no need to be scared of what is going on in our lives. And we have no need to question God about why he is placing us in a position or a situation that we are in. When we have the love of God, we fully trust God and his plan, even if we don't know that plan. Church, we have to fully experience the love of God to understand the love of God. Naomi became disobedient to his love. And because of this, she let her depravity bring her down into a pit of despair. And church, if we're not careful, we can fall into this pit as well. When we become disobedient to God, when we try to walk away from the love of God, and we, we don't see the blessings that we have in our life because of him, we can fall into that pit of depravity in our own life. And while Naomi may not have understood what was going on, God's love was shaping her and the situation that she was in. He was using it so that her life would become full, and he was using it to allow her to receive the redemptive process that was happening for all people. In Ephesians 3, 18 through 19, Paul says, and you may have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Through it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Church, God was shaping Naomi in a way that she didn't know. He was using her situation to work her through a redemptive process that that she wasn't even aware of in her life. He was using the situation to turn her towards him so that she could see this need for him in her life, that there was no other person that was going to fill this vacancy. What we see is that at one time she was empty. At one time, she felt she had nothing, but because of the redemptive love of God, she had now become full. She had now seen her life renewed through this baby. But church, that leads us to the redemptive family. Verses 18 through 22, we see this genealogy. We see this line of secession from Perez all the way to Jesse, who fathered David. And the reason we see this long line of genealogy in these five verses is most likely to not establish the long list of these descendants, but rather to establish the line of the Messiah. From redemptive law to redemptive love, we see a redemptive family. From the line of a woman who wanted to be called Mara, who thought that her God had left her, who thought that he had treated her very harshly. God chose her and her family to form a bloodline for the redeemer of her people and all people. Or Matthew 1, 4 through 6, we see this genealogy here as well. Except the one difference in Matthew versus this is we see Ruth's name mentioned. We see that the genealogy and the secession of the line of Christ, Christ used that redemptive law. He reused that redemptive love to form this redemptive family that we have all been called to. We see that God used Ruth's situation to form the line of our Redeemer. And what we can truly see is that from Obed to Jesse to David, that Jesus is not only the God of the Jews, but he is the king of the world, church. And as we conclude the book of Ruth, this book has been about more than just the people in this story. 
What we see is this beautiful redemptive process. We see it reminds us of our inability to redeem ourselves and save ourselves. What we see is that in a small town thousands of years ago, God brought a redemption story to light that never stopped. He redeemed a woman who was faced with her need for him. He started a bloodline that led to Mary and Joseph that led them back to Bethlehem to the same town under the same stars where this book is taking place so that a baby would be delivered who would ultimately deliver us from our sins, from our depravity, and who would ultimately become a redemption church. We see the sovereignty of God in every word of this book. And we are reminded of the sacrifice of Christ for us to be received into the family of God so that we can have a life with him, so that we can have a redemptive love, so that we can have a redemption in our life that is comparable to what we see with Ruth and Boaz. We are reminded, the church, that in our inability, in our depravity, it is Christ who lived a perfect life, who died on the cross to become our sacrifice whose death justified us with his free gift of grace, bringing us together as the bride of Christ.